You know what your problem is? It's that you think you have a problem. Think about it. We live in a world where you, even in the lowest income levels in this country, or whatever country you're listening to us in, live better than kings and queens of old did. We have access to cleaner housing, better food, better cars, better clothing, better everything, all at the touch of a button. And yet we think that there is something wrong with us. We think that there is some fundamental problem that needs to be fixed. But I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with you. Your mindset? Yeah, maybe, but not you. Today's guest coaches and lectures worldwide and has shared this message thousands of times. There is nothing wrong with you. And he's here today to tell you why. Welcome to the Evolve Podcast. Evolve your body, evolve your mind, evolve your soul, and evolve your tribe. And now it's time to disrupt. And with that, folks, we want to welcome you to another episode of the Evolve Podcast. I am your host, Steve Cutler, and what a crazy day it is here in Utah. Normally, I say somewhere in the mountains of Utah, and I think that's probably no more true than today because, wow, it's a whiteout outside. Yeah. And guys, today's guest is a returning guest, and I believe now, Todd, you've been on the Evolve podcast more than any other guest, and wow. because I believe your message is so powerful for men and women. So for our listeners out there, if you have not listened to Evolve 58 and Evolve 6 with Todd Sylvester, go ahead and binge on those right after this episode. That's the sort of binging we love at the Evolve podcast. Todd also did an episode with me on gratitude. Uh, and so I would encourage you to go listen to those. The one, the only Todd Sylvester, my good friend, thanks for joining us once again. Hey, Steve, great to be here, man. That intro was powerful. I, I'm on fire right now, dude. I that energy, it's beautiful. But uh, no, you know, truly, it's a, it's a, it's my honor and blessing to be on your show. I've always admired you, Steve, for for many years now. You were my personal trainer for, for almost two years, um, and I learned so much from you. And I just, I actually, you know, just utilized a lot of the principles you taught me. That's made me to be where I'm at today. So. For those who don't know this, I mean, Steve, Steve was one of those giants that I'm standing on right now. I'm standing on his shoulders uh, to be able to be here with you guys tonight. So hopefully what I share tonight will benefit uh, you and just know that it's it's coming from the, the giants that I've been standing on their shoulders. And Steve's one of those giants. I would have to be a proverbial giant since I am a small man, but uh, I appreciate the compliment there. Uh, and uh, Todd, you've got a powerful message that you share in your lectures and uh, and on your wildly successful podcast. So as a returning guest, uh, I want to change it up a little bit and just talk about, um, dig deeper into some different questions that we don't always get a chance to dig in with our uh, our guests with because you're you're a returning guest but first tell our listeners a little bit about yourself if they haven't listened to some of our epi other episodes yes uh, yet uh, give them a brief background yeah so i'm currently a, i call myself a mental fitness coach and a counselor i've been doing that for 33 years and um it's really grown over the last say i probably went full-time about 12 years ago and uh, it's been the greatest thing in my life. And it all started from uh, taking a, uh, my first sip of alcohol when I was 11 years old. Mm. And that opened up a whole life of drugs and alcohol from that point forward and became addicted. And long story short, but I was getting ready to end my life because it just got to a point where I hated so much of who I am. I'd just rather not live anymore. Basketball was my passion. I had a scholarship and I lost it because I was drinking and partying and I just thought, you know, I'm not worth it anymore. So had a, a really cool thing that happened that changed the course of my life. And when that happened, I said to myself, I want to dedicate my life to helping other people with addiction, you know, whether it's anxiety, depression, you name it, it didn't matter to me. I thought I want to do whatever I can to help other people. And so that was 33 years ago. And I've been doing this and uh, helping people for that many years. And, and so that's a little bit of a background of how I got to where I'm at today. 
I love that. And you, you certainly have evolved over the years. I mean, um, going from uh, getting clean and sober to helping other people, and there's different iterations of how you've done that with your lectures, with your podcast, with your coaching, uh, so many different ways that you have worked and evolved into the into the person that you are today. Um, now, Todd, you work typically with people who are in a rehab or a post-rehabilitative setting uh, for drugs and alcohol, right? So, so yeah. well, we, we're not necessarily going to dig hard in or dig into hard drugs and, and rehab today. I do want to talk about other ways that people drug or numb themselves, because I believe that there are so many different ways that people are drugging themselves, numbing the pain of life, and they're avoiding the pain. Um, you know, if you're overweight, you've probably been drugging yourself with food or excessive beverages. If you're angry regularly, you're drugging yourself with the high that comes from being angry. You can scroll on social media, watch porn, spend hours watching television, or go to the movies. I mean, they're all drugs. They're all things that take us away from pain. So I think that there's a commonality here uh, with what we're talking about and what you deal with. I'd like to talk about what people are avoiding. What are some of the most common things that you see people avoid? Well, that's a great question. And I'd like to maybe preface that with a little bit of a foundation here. Sure. I think I want to, I want to define what depression is because everyone has their definitions and there's the, there's the tech textbook definition, but I want to give you one that I believe is the most accurate definition of what depression is. And here it is pretending to be someone I'm not. Wow. And I think if we're really going to get down to the bottom of things, like you said, whether it's I'm overweight, whether I'm addicted to alcohol, pornography, drugs, whether I oversleep, undersleep, watch too much Netflix, whatever it may be. Um, I think what, what I see more than anything is we're constantly trying to prove ourselves that we're worthy. Mm. I think we're constantly trying to look at me, look at, I'm going to go. Uh, it's that, it's that old, uh, that crux, that crux. Um, what's the way to say that, that trap of saying, I'll be happy when, or yeah. I'll be happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think, see, it's really the trick of the ego. The ego tells us to go after something that we already possess. So my message has always been, there's nothing wrong with you. And, and really what that is, and you mentioned that in the highlight before we got started is Truly, it doesn't mean we don't have stuff to work on, but to our core, you're good. Your worth is set. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Yeah. But our ego tells us, hey, go do this and then you'll be okay. Then people will like you or then life will be hunky-dory. And so I think what we're doing is we're constantly trying to prove ourselves, which is a form of pretending to be someone I'm not, which leaves us empty which leads us feeling sad and hopeless. And ultimately that's what depression is. What a great definition. And, and it's really interesting. You bring up the ego. Um, I'm rereading the book, the war of art by Stephen Pressfield. Phenomenal mm, book. Yeah. If you haven't read it uh, for any of our listeners out there, a very short book. It's, it, it, it's like my daily meditation right now. Uh, I'm probably in my fourth or fifth time of going through it. He talks about the ego, and, and we all have to have an ego in order to live our life, right? The ego is the thing that gets us up. The ego is what helps us to make money. But the ego is not us. The ego is fed by the things that we do, but it's not us. It's not the deep I am inside of us. And I love how you talk about the difference between the ego and what is already there. We're trying to possess something that we already have. We already have value. We already have worth. That's infinite. That's inside of us. And we don't need to prove those things. But the ego is really funny, isn't it? Because it, it, while it's the best thing to get us up and going, to get to go make money, to provide for our families, to do the things we need to, it is the absolute worst thing when it comes to our self-esteem. Because it tells us that we're lacking something. It's like, no, no, no. The deeper wisdom of the soul can speak back and say, all right, ego, go, go take a seat in the back of the bus. We don't need you. Exactly. Yeah. And very well said, Steve. And I, and, and again, you know, ego is, there's positives to it. You know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with trying to achieve and go get things and, and right. to have goals to shoot for. And, 
you know, you know, you wouldn't be doing this podcast if you didn't have that ego driving you in some way. Right. But right. Steve, you know, I've known you a long time, and I know you're 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 the same Steve to me, whether you're doing this podcast or not. You are you're already set. I look at you and I I see greatness. I saw I saw it the day I met you. So all the stuff you've done on top of that since then doesn't matter to me in the sense that I now think you're better. I've always thought you were good the day I met you. Yeah. And that, and that, I think that's one of the keys, right? When you talk about that, there's nothing wrong with a person that doesn't mean yeah. growth and evolution doesn't need to be there because the reality is right. mu much of our life, I think is, is unraveling and getting back to what is true inside of us, isn't it? Right. We're, we're yeah. uh, as Marianne Williams said, uh, Williamson said that, you know, it's the light, not the darkness that, that we're afraid of. Todd, what are some of the yeah. most common things when you, when you talk about that people are pretending to be something that they're not, what, what are people running from? Are there emotional things? Are there uh, problems in their life? What are, what are they running away from? Well, a lot of things, honestly, I mean, none of us want to be uncomfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable. So what do mm. we do? We do, we do the easy route and we try to just be comfortable. Yeah. It's uncomfortable to confront someone who may be offending us. So mm. what do we do? We shut up. So we run from being assertive. We run from, you know, telling maybe a loved one, like in setting a boundary going, you know, I don't appreciate you talking to me this way. But again, what do we do? We run from that because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. You know, yeah. it's funny. I was just with a client before we got on here and her very struggle is she has a hard time being assertive with people around her. And I shared this story and I think it will be appropriate for our listeners here right now. Um, you know, everyone knows who Michael Jackson was, you know, the, you know, King of pop, right? Yep. We all know that he died of a propofol overdose. Mm -hmm. And this story came out after he had passed away, his entourage that was around him working 24 seven, they were the ones going to get the propofol from that doctor. And as they're handing it to him, they they're in their minds they're going this is going to kill him this is killing michael right but they didn't dare say anything one because he's the king of pop you don't want to offend him yeah. and we're getting paid and we're whatever right and but a real friend steve would have said hey michael i'm not getting your propofol because this is going to kill you but i'll get you some help michael probably would have fired that guy but so that michael would have fired the one guy that actually get, gave a shit about him yeah. And so yeah. the point is, the point is we're afraid to offend someone because we don't want to hurt them. And I'll, I'll always tell my clients when I sit down with them on our first session, I'll say, do you want me to be honest or do you want me to be nice? And without fail, they always great say, well, question. Honest, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll great say, question. yeah, okay. You want me to be honest? Honest doesn't always feel nice. Yeah. And so I think we, we run from t just really speaking our truth. Because mm -hmm. we're afraid that someone's going to be offended. We're afraid that, oh, because I said this. And if I did that as a counselor with someone who is blowing up their lives with heroin and, you know, and meth, the last thing they need is someone to be nice. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean I'm not compassionate. I have a lot of compassion. Matter of fact, I have more than most people, I think, in that area. But I'm actually brutally honest with these clients because they need to hear the hard truth. So, I know that was a little segue, but we're running from all kinds of stuff. We just want to be comfortable. So what do we do? We sit on our lazy boys and we shut out life and we just live it on these damn phones. Yeah. And next, no, you know, we're not doing anything. So I don't know if that answers the question in the way you wanted, but that's kind of where I'm thinking. No, I think it's a great, um, it, it, it's a great segue into my next question of how are people drugging themselves from what you're seeing. I mean, not just drugs and alcohol, but, and you brought up the phone, right? That's a, that's a very, very common way people are avoiding pain. And I think they're avoiding discomfort, but, but what are some other things that you're seeing? What are people doing to avoid that pain? Well, I mean, again, number of ways, uh, they'll play small. That's, I see this more than Interesting. anything else. Okay. They play small. And what does that mean exactly? It's like, I'm going to do the bare minimum today at my job. I'm going to do the bare minimum in my life because 
going above and beyond that, it, it's 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 can be challenging. It can be a little scary. It can be me being a little vulnerable. And what happens is I see a lot of times uh, people playing small. And when we play small, then you know what? The expectations people have for us are really low, mm. right? And I see this a lot, especially in the addiction recovery world, is they play small and it's like, oh, I've got this disease, I'm broken, I'm damaged, handle me with kid gloves. So I get to play small because my family can't really push me too hard because I got something wrong with me. Well, no, uh, what I teach the clients is you can no longer use that excuse anymore, right? And I'm, I'm ultimately teaching these clients to start playing big again in their life. So that's the broad answer is I see so many people, Steve, that are playing small in their lives. And that to me is devastating. Yeah. Wow. I, I It's a phenomenal answer. It's not really an answer I would have expected, but I can see that. It brings me to another question. When yeah. you think about these things that people do, right? Playing small, getting on the phone, leaning too much into the ego. What if somebody were to just look at their life and say, hey, I'm going to go in an opposite direction. So instead of playing small, like you talked about, I'm going to go play big. Instead of leaning into the ego, I'm going to maybe meditate a little bit more and ask my soul what it needs. Instead of being on my phone, I'm going to set it down and go out in nature. Wow, what, what, a, what a powerful thing that would be if you identified where some of those limiting behaviors were, not just beliefs, but behaviors. I'm playing small, right? I, I'm, I'm doing this action of playing small. I'm listening to my ego. Well, what if you did the opposite? What would that look like? Yeah. How do you well, get yeah. people to go and into I, playing big? Uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to steal something from one of my guests named Mary crafts. She was just on my podcast. I haven't posted it yet. Okay. She's 69 years old. And she's a motivational speaker. And she's decided to do that just a couple of years ago. And now she's like doing it full time, wow. killing it out there. She's 69. That's amazing. And I said, how did you do this? And she said, Todd, I wrote, a, I wrote a question on my mirror and I read it every single morning. And here's what it says. What would I do today if I had no fear? Beautiful. And I thought, and see, see, fear keeps us playing small. If I say, if I don't have fear today, what would I do if I didn't have any fear? And then I list off the things that I would, that I would do if I wasn't afraid, then that's me playing big. So I'm going to go play big today. And I'm going to push through that fear. I'm going to knock it over and I'm going to go do those three things that I normally wouldn't do because I let fear rule my life. And I, when she said that to me, I'm going, dang, that, that made so much sense to me. And so that is a good way to wake us up first thing in the morning going, what would you do today if you had no fear? It's a great thing. I just wrote that down. What would I do today if I had no fear? It takes me back to, um, you know, certain points in my life where I've thought to myself, there was something deep in my soul saying, hey, Steve, go this direction, start this thing, yeah. uh, you know, and I would put it off and I put it off and put it off and I'd come up with every excuse in the book and I would drug myself with excuses <laughs> and yeah. Over time, I realized that uh, I wasn't doing it because of some sort of fear. And and sometimes it was really small fear. Sometimes it was just something yeah. that was so stupid. Well, I'm not going to do this and post that on social media because what would other people think? Well, who the hell cares? Who are these people? And and, and if they think anything, it's for a millisecond, and then they move on, right? They, but we think yeah. and make things out to be bigger than what they are. And, Wow, what a powerful question. I wonder can, what can that I would do. Something? Please. Yeah. Well, I want to, sorry to cut you off, but I want to say something, what you just said there. You know, I see these videos sometimes on social media where it's like, you know, I'm going to do this for all the people that doubted me. I'm going to do this for all the people who didn't believe in me. And I'm going to show yeah. them. And, yeah. Yeah. and you know what? I laugh at this because here's why. So silly. I don't think anyone's doing that. No, I don't think no, anyone's doing Steve, you can't do this. Right. The only one doing that is you to it's you. Yourself. Yeah. yeah, I agree. There's no one on the street going, Steve, you can't do this. Yeah. Right. It's, it's our own selves that are telling us. So if anything, I'm going to fight that narrative in my head that's telling me I'm not enough. And I'm going to look that narrative right in the teeth and say, nice try. 
You yeah. watch me. I'm going to step through this and I'm going to do the exact thing that my own doubt is telling me I can't do. It's yeah. not some crowd on the street going, Todd can't do it. Todd yeah. can't do it. No. Amen. <laughs> It makes no sense to me, dude. I, it's so funny you say that because I laugh when people say that on social media posts too. Like, I'm going to go back. I'm yeah. going to prove them. Nobody gives a shit. Like, nobody's looking who's at you. Been? Who's and, and they don't yes. care. Yeah, I had a conversation with a couple of people recently, and, and one of the guys, um, I mean, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I can't, you know, professionally diagnose this person as a narcissist, but I'm pretty damn sure that they are. Because I've met a, a, a very few uh, a very small number in my life and and the, I, I believe that this guy was is is a true narcissist and he was talking about oh my gosh so this group uh you know my reputation with that group and this person and this and just going on and on and on and oh, i've got to i got to do this because i have to prove to them but i have to prove this and i have to prove that i'm like what the hell are you talking about nobody gives a shit they're living their own life no one's talking about you Let's talk about what you're doing. No one cares. Like, yeah. I know you, you, you think you're super important and I don't mean that in some sort of flippant way, but I really think that's yeah. the reality. And if you are struggling in life, I don't mean to be mean, but nobody gives a shit. Like, I, and, and not that, okay, we're not there to help you, but like, no one's looking at you and saying, Oh yeah, you suck. You know, you're never going to succeed. Fact, I think those people are actually going, no, you can do it. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You step up to the plate. If you say you're going to do it, Steve, then go do it. I'm, and I'm going to cheer right. you on when you, right. I think most people in our lives, that's what they're doing. They're actually saying, we would love to see you finally do something. Let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I've, I, you know, recently, as you know, I have uh, shifted the focus of Evolve, not just the the podcast, but we're expanding the coaching as well. And that's something that's been yeah. in the back of my mind for quite some time. And my soul just kept speaking to me and saying, this is why you're here. You know, I mean, my purpose in life is to help millions of people transform their lives. And so I've, I've tried to do that in multiple ways, speaking, my radio show, my podcast, you know, several different ways over the years. But um, the itch just couldn't get scratched. And, uh, you know, I started to go in that direction. As soon as I started to ask people questions, hey, what do you think? Or how could, what, what, what's your thought? What's your advice? Ah, I'm kind of struggling with this. I mean, I'm 46, almost 47 years old. Do I really restart a, a, a coaching business like this? I didn't have one person tell me no. I didn't have one person shoot me down. I didn't have one person, you know, do anything other than just root for me immediately. And frankly, I think that's what life is. I think we tell ourselves stories where uh, we, we, we run from the reality and we run from pain and we tell ourselves a story, well, other people are against me. Now, they're, they're really not. And if you think they are, you're, you're, you're probably doing something to piss them off, right? <laughs> and in a way, I think that's just another drug. Like we talked about at the very beginning, anger is a drug. Uh, distress, that's a drug. Drama is a drug. I mean, we all know those people that lean into the drama. That is a drug. And it's an avoidance, right? Like uh, Pressfield talks about it in his book, The War of Art. It's an avoidance of actually doing the work that it takes. If I get involved in drama, I don't have to do the work. It's easier to get involved in drama than it is to yeah. do the work to change myself. Yeah, totally. Todd, how can people face their fears? What do you teach people to do so that they stop avoiding the pain and start to face their fears? Yeah, and it comes back to what we you just said a minute ago about telling we're telling ourselves stories right? The yeah. most powerful force in the human psyche is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Mm. And for those who are listening, psyche means mind, spirit, and soul. Yeah. So the, the most powerful force in the mind, spirit, and soul is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. And what I do with my clients is I help them, un, I basically help them unravel this story they've been telling themselves. And the top three things that I hear more than anything else in my 30 years in doing this, number one is I'm not good enough. Number two is I'm different, so I can't connect with people. Number three is my problems are too big. I've always been this way. I'll never be able to change. Yeah. And then I, I always like to add a fourth one, ultimately back to, you know, I'm just not, something's wrong with me. Ultimately, something's just fundamentally wrong. wrong yeah. Fundamentally wrong. And yeah. so- 
I think identifying those, and I think your listeners hearing this, I bet they can identify with all four of those going, yeah, especially number one, we all, it all feeds into, I'm not good enough. So what do we do? We try to prove ourselves, which causes suffering, right? When we're constantly trying to prove ourselves, we're suffering on some level, or we go back to playing small. And that way I don't have to have anyone judge me or put myself out there. So one, you have to identify those things that you're struggling with. The second thing is you have to start reshaping your narrative, mm. right? You know, you have to, you know, step out of that old narrative and step in. Don't lean into it, but actually step right into telling yourself a different story. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I have a client right now who he had this belief. He, he's, he goes, Todd, I'm a procrastinator. I procrastinate everything. I put everything off. And I said, who told you you're a procrastinator? Long, little long pause. And and my client goes, well, I do. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I said, that's part of your problem. I go, I'm not denying that you don't procrastinate. I'm sure you do. But it's because you keep labeling yourself. That's your story. I'm a procrastinator. So I said, what if instead of saying you're a procrastinator, what if you started saying I'm a go-getter? I get things done. Yeah. And he looked at me a little puzzled and I said, let's put it to the test. Let's get one. Let's do this for one week. Procrastinator out. I'm a go-getter. I get things done for one week. I want you to say that throughout the day. And I want you to watch the miracle start to take place. I kid you not, Steve. And I've done this with thousands of clients. This guy comes back a week later and goes, dude, I cannot believe how powerful this has been for me. I have, I, what I've normally put off in my life, I did them. Why? Because I get things done. I'm a go-getter. Yeah. And it was it was so, so beautiful to watch. And this was a, this was literally in seven days, right? And just by changing the narrative. So for your listeners, and I know there's work to be done. He wasn't completely where he needed to be, but he had shifted the energy in such a direction that he he was like, wow, he was so amazed what happened within just seven days. And now, obviously, the goal is to stay there because it takes a minute to kind of make that a lifestyle. Right, right. But that's the power, Steve, of changing the narrative. And so I, that's, that's where I would start with anyone. Well, the thing I've stolen from you, and I can't tell you how many times I've used it ever since I stole it from you, whatever follows I am follows you. Right. I, I actually yeah. use that in, I reference you when I use that uh, in my lectures. I was speaking to a company recently, a group of leaders, and I've actually got you quoted in my, uh, my lecture deck. So when I'm teaching um, and I'm doing these all day workshops and seminars on leadership and coaching, uh, I, it, it goes to one slide and it says, whatever follows I am follows me, Todd Sylvester. And I use that because it's so powerful. However you tell your story, whatever you define yourself as, that will follow you. Yeah. But then your behaviors will follow that. And, and one thing that I will say, I've heard from people that say, well, I'm, don't, don't say that. Don't say I am this because that's a lie. Well, it's not a lie. Because as soon as you step into that and you say, I am whatever it is you're moving towards, you you yeah. already are a part of that that lives inside of your soul it's already part of you anyway right and so if we're going to talk about nonlinear time and time is a relative thing rather than newtonian time it's always been there it, it was it is and it always will be inside of your soul so whatever you're telling yourself that you are it always will be so if you someone calls themselves a procrastinator but they only procrastinate 50 percent of the time all right do the math so why are they a procrastinator if they procrastinate 50 percent of the time so as soon as you shift and say hey i'm a guy that gets things done and now 10 to 20 percent of the time you get things done well you still get things done what if you improve that to 30 or 40 percent at what point does it shift so Anybody out there that's listening to this that says, oh, I'm not going to use affirmations because it's just you're just lying to yourself. No, it's not. It's putting it into your soul and it's throwing it out there to the universe that you will become whatever it is that you consistently tell yourself. Your behaviors will match up with it. In fact, um, 
James Clear talked about this in his book, Atomic Habits, that that's one of the most powerful things in creating a habit is change your identity. What would a fit person do? Well, they would go work out on a regular basis. What would a healthy person do? Well, they would eat healthy food on a regular basis. What would an outgoing gregarious person do? They'd smile and say hi, right? So wherever your challenge is, wherever your problem is, it starts by changing that identity. I love, Todd, how you're talking about the story because stories are, I mean, there's amazing stories out there in books, movies, television, phenomenal stories and characters that we follow. You know, whether you love the hero or the anti-hero, whatever it is, you follow a storyline of of those people. There's, there are things, there are qualities that you admire. And I found great um, power, I guess you could say, in writing and rewriting my story. If I say, okay, this is what I want to accomplish. And then I walk back and say, okay, this is who I am and or who I need to become in order to accomplish this. And here's my story that I want to write. That's, I mean, every story has pain. Every story has that point where you're not sure if the hero is going to make it. And then they triumphantly come through at the end. So this idea that we tell ourselves that life is bad. And so I must be bad. Life is hard. And so there must be something fundamentally wrong with me. Now that's part of the hero's journey. What do you do to help people to rewrite their story? I know you do the I am statements, but what beyond that are you doing to coach people to write their story? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I have my clients create a personal declaration statement. And what a declaration is, for those who are listening, when I declare something, I'm acknowledging that I possess it already. Mm. So you know how, you know, companies, companies have mission statements, right? So this is like a mission statement for your life, but I like to call it a declaration. I'm going to declare this is who I am. This is what I'll stand for. This is what I'll fight for. This is what I'll die for. This is who I am. And you stated it's already fact. So what they do is I have them, like if I was telling this to you, Steve, I'd say, okay, Steve, I want you to create the ultimate Steve on paper in paragraph form as if you already possess. You can talk about your career, your life, your family, the way you carry yourself, you know, any goals and dreams you may have, right? And you can get as specific as you want. And then what you do is you create this is if you've already got it. So for an example would be, you wouldn't put, I, Steve, hope to one day be a best-selling author. Yeah. What you would say is, I, Steve, am a best-selling author selling children's books, inspiring them to believe in themselves, to stay physically and mentally fit. And I get letters from them all over the world saying, thank you for writing this book that changed my life. See how specific that is? Love that. And so the more specific we can be in this declaration, Right. And it's a living document, which means you can edit it and change it every day. Right. Just so like life. I, yeah. So yeah. I have them create this and and then I have them start. It becomes part of their morning ritual and they're and right before they go to bed. They, that's something they state um, out loud. And I'm telling you, my I had my mentor who taught me this 30 plus years ago to create this in my life. Everything I've ever put in there has come to pass on some, in some form or another. Wow! It is amazing. It's like a, it's been a guidepost of my life. And it's interesting. It's like, I really believe when you speak it, you manifest it. And so that's where I get people started. So yes, you have your, I am statements, knowing who you are, that kind of stuff, which is powerful. But when you add this element to it, boy, it puts it on steroids. And then, then we get to a point where I have them start visualizing doing their declaration statement in detail mm. like like olympic athletes do with their events right yeah it you add that factor into so it's these little you know baby steps but boy i'll tell you that declaration statement has been one of the single greatest thing i've ever done uh when it comes to setting and achieving goals in my life i i absolutely love that you know one of the things that's been a cornerstone to my coaching over the years is really just this idea that you have to develop skills in order to achieve what you want in life, right? Now it's skills and ability uh, lead to your habits that lead to the evolved life that you want. And so um, when I, whether I'm coaching a group of leaders or I'm one-on-one with somebody, uh, I'm really leaning into this concept of developing the, the, the skills that they need in order to become what they want to become and to, and to achieve. But you can't do that unless you are laser focused, clear, 
on what it is that you want to achieve. So I love how you break it down. And it's not just that I, I want to become a best-selling author, but I am a best-selling author who sells a number of books and who gets to, right? You're painting this picture. There's a lot of nuance to that picture that you're yeah. painting that becomes alive. It becomes this story in your mind. And when we tell ourselves yeah. stories, we don't have to remember all of the details because we see them, we feel them. As soon as you see a story, I mean, if, if for our listeners, I'm sure that they, if, if we were to say a word or a character, you know, if I said Harry Potter, you could come up with the story, you could see the imagery, you could see the scar on his forehead, you could see his glasses, right? You automatically remember the details because of the storyline. And we don't do enough to write our own story so that the nuanced detail is there. And when it's done in a declarative fashion, what a powerful, powerful technique. So I would say that's a massive skill and massive ability that helps people to uh, lean in to where they want to go. Todd, talk about what's a, what's a tip if somebody's in a moment of darkness right now, or even just a moment of dullness. So maybe life has become dull and they've accepted mediocrity and they've accepted this. Uh, yeah, I was 10 pounds overweight. Now I'm 20 and uh, it's not that bad. If they're in that dullness or darkness, how do people start to move into the light? Yeah, great question, Steve. First of all, my heart goes out to you if you're in that place, because mm. I've been there and it's not fun to be there. And sometimes it can feel like no one cares. So if I could say one thing just in the beginning, I care about you and I, I don't even know you and I can say I love you um, because I am you. Um, wow. I'm not where I am today because I magically had, you know, someone just gave this to me. Someone showed me the way. Thankfully, I listened. There's a quote by Benjamin Franklin. To be honest with you, I don't know if he actually said it, but he got the credit. But here's what the quote goes like this. Some people die at 25, but aren't buried until they're 75. Mm, and I think this happens to the majority of people. I think what we do is we get to a point in our lives where like, oh, well, I didn't really achieve my goals. This is what life is. Life seems kind of, you know, dreary. Life yeah. sucks. I suck. And what we do is then we just kind of exist until eventually we die and then we're buried. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I call existing. I think what most people want is they want to truly live. So one of the things I would ask these people who might be in that dark place, what would it look like if you truly started living? It kind of goes back to that question we asked, what would you do today if you had no fear? Right. Yeah. So what would it look like instead of just existing? What would it look like to really tr start living? And it might be as simple as I'm going to start expressing gratitude today. You know, I, I'm telling you, gratitude is the most powerful stimulant on the planet. And gratitude, we, we did a little episode on that, Steve, which was really yep. cool. Yep. And we talked about, you know, people might say, well, yeah, gratitude. Well, I'm not talking about just doing a gratitude list. I'm talking about list three things you're grateful for. And then why are you grateful for them? So like I, I might put, I'm grateful for Steve's friendship. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be on Steve's podcast. Let's say, okay. I've got my list. And did I feel a little gratitude for that? Sure. But if I say I'm grateful for Steve's friendship because he's a giant among men and I get to stand on his shoulders, he's taught me more things than most people that I know. And because of that, it's made me a better person. So man, that gratitude I have for Steve, it just exudes because I'm now feeling it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think if you're in a dark place, if you could find find one thing you're grateful for and then why and then express it to someone i'm telling you dude it it that will make a huge difference and again baby steps right but i'll tell you we need to get out of that mindset of just existing and start living we weren't meant to be miserable i get it we have miserable moments and we have miserable times but what happens is if misery becomes our foundation then we have moments of joy, moments of happiness. We need to flip that foundation. 
and the foundation becomes happiness and joy. And then we have moments of sadness. We have moments of misery. Yeah. Yet my foundation, because I've created these habits in my life, and it starts with being grateful. I'm telling you, that's what we do. That that skill, that's something that I learned from you uh, when we did the gratitude episode of not just make a list of what you're grateful for, but why and go deep on the why that has made yes. one of the biggest impacts in my life, because when I focus on that and I really sit in this moment of gratitude, the feeling yeah. of gratitude grows it wells up inside of me you know we live in a world where people talk about emotion but i don't think we become more emotionally intelligent as a society i think we talk about emotion but we become uh, really dumb quite frankly i mean i wouldn't i i don't know what the opposite of intelligent is but stupid dumb ignorant uh, you know all of those words because we talk about it but we're not becoming more emotionally intelligent emotions come and go. I had a horrible emotion a couple of days ago. You know why? Because I ate food that wasn't congruent with my body and I felt like garbage afterwards. So then what if I if I let the emotion lead, then that's going to lead me in a direction and I'm going to become I say, well, this is my truth of this emotion. No, I ate some shit. And as soon as it went away, and I, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that when we went out to eat. Okay, well, this is why. Emotion shouldn't drive. Our principles, our values, our choices should drive. And then great emotion comes afterwards. And so this exercise that you're talking about of sitting down and not just listing out what you're grateful for, but sitting in this gratitude moment by saying this is why that's how gratitude grows you want more love in your life do things that bring love you want more gratitude do that particular exercise whatever it is that you want in your life don't let the emotion drive you but go build the emotion by doing the things that gets there you want confidence go lift some weights you want even more confidence discipline your eating do some cardio, lose some body fat. You're going to have more confidence. Keep your chin up, stand with better posture, do these things. And all of that stuff is going to come. I was working with a client earlier today and, uh, you know, it has some uh, postural issues. And I said, you know, we're going to go through. And as we're changing your posture through some of these exercises and stretches, we're going to plant some ideas in your head when you're in a different space, because right now you're feeling kind of sad and depressed and, you know, lonely. And, and that's normal when you have posture like this. So we go through a stretch, comes back up. Okay. I want you to feel confident. And all of a sudden her eyes just pop open. She's like, Oh yeah, well I do feel confident. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, because you're stretching, you're, you're strengthening. Now you're standing up different. Your gratitude exercise brings gratitude. It's not just some surface level thing. It digs in and it feeds gratitude. So I absolutely love that. Todd, I know we are coming up on our time because you've got to jump to another client here in just a few minutes, but I want to make sure we get through uh, a few other questions uh, sure. before we let you go. What is something that you've learned in the last uh, two to three years that excites you the most? Wow. That's a good question. I mean, I feel like I'm learning every day because I mean, sitting with clients who have been through some horrific things and they they are fighting through that and they're they're prevailing. I guess if I, if I could say what I'm most excited about is the power of the human spirit. I think I've kind of always known that, but lately, oh my goodness, I think that's been something that's really stood out to me. And you get it too. You interview a lot, a lot of people on the show. I get to interview people on my podcast. I get to sit with clients. I mean, I see probably about 15 clients a day. And think about that. I hear more stories and stuff. And I always walk out away from those going, people are amazing. Yeah. People are resilient. People are so like, we can do hard things. It's hard to kill the human spirit. I mean, it just is. So resilient. And so I guess if 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 I was to answer that, that's probably the thing over the last several years that has just been in my face that people are amazing because they can do hard things. I love that's that. probably what stood out the most. 
I, th- I think I know the answer to this next question, but I'm curious still. What do you feel like you know that other people don't know, but you wish they did? Oh, wow. <laughs> Man, that's a good question. Um, I've never had that question actually uh, asked that way. What do I know that other people don't know about what I wish they did know? I think what comes to my mind is I struggle just like everybody else does, I guess. I think a lot of times people might think the position I'm in, and again, I'm not better than anyone by any stretch, don't get me wrong, but I think people think, oh, Todd, you're always so positive. You've got all these people, you're doing all these things, man, your life must be amazing. And it is, my life is really good, but I still struggle. A lot of people don't know this and I'm going to get really vulnerable here, but I was diagnosed bipolar several years ago Mm. and probably one of the most difficult things I've ever heard um, to hear that. I mean, to hear those words and um, luckily this was years ago again. Luckily, I had a mentor who's a giant who I'm standing on his shoulders as well. He said, well, congratulations, Todd. You've got your superpower. (laughs) Awesome. I was like, what? I go, are you freaking nuts, dude? This is this sucks. And he's like, no, dude. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, it's going to be your superpower. And here's why. You're going to have to work twice as hard as maybe the next person because of this. But because of that extra work. Well, you're going to grow on levels that you never would have had you not had it. I'm telling you, it was the greatest thing I've ever heard from someone. And I I literally, I went from despair to freaking jubilation. It was amazing. And so if I could let anyone know, I have my struggles. I have things that I'm dealing with mentally. I have things that I've dealt with in my past. I, I still have my struggles. So I just want people to know that, that I'm you. I still have my battles that I'm going through. Yeah. Great, great uh, perspective because I think in today's day and age, when people see other people and it looks like from all outside appearances that they're doing well. uh, And and especially for somebody like you, who has got great wisdom. You coach people, you speak, you do your podcast. People would say, Oh, he's arrived as if success is some sort of destination and that we don't continually evolve and grow and we don't have challenges, but the reality is we all do, right? Henry Ford, um, or no, I can't remember. Now I just said Henry Ford and and, and it took me to the car. Um, (laughs) One of the, one of the Fords uh, that was an actor. I used to throw up uh, before every performance, uh, well into his eighties, maybe even nineties when he was acting. I mean, one of the greatest actors of his time and, so I think understanding that this is we're, we're all on a path, we're all on a journey and we're trying to grow and evolve as, as we go. Uh, it doesn't mean we reach a destination where we say, okay, here we are in the land of promise. And this is amazing. There's no other challenges. That's just, that's not life. So I love that you well, shared and, that. And, yeah. And to go along with that, the best definition of success I've ever heard is waking up in a good mood. Oh, I love that's that. the definition of success because I can have all these things. If, if I'm, if I'm not waking up in a good mood, what's the point? Yeah. So I, if, if I'm not waking up in a good mood consistently, something's off in my life and I better go address those things and get some help. Right. And I, and I say that to anyone out there, if you're not waking up in a good mood, something's off Yeah. because if you've got all the, all the external things, great, good for you. But at the same time, if you're waking up miserable, what's the point? Yeah. So let's yep. figure that out. We should experience joy again in our lives like we did when we were younger. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. <laughs> Todd, final question for you. What are you currently doing to evolve? Yeah, I'm doing, I got really uh, vulnerable and I, I created an app I've been working on for over a year now. Nice. We're hopefully going live on March 17th and we're in beta right now, which is really cool. It's called the Euro K mental fitness app. Um, that's how I've, you know, evolved in my just trying to do something to, to, to share more content, to reach more people, that kind of thing. Um, what I'm doing to evolve more in my life. Okay. To be honest with you, I bought a cold plunge about three months ago. What? And yeah, I got, why, why haven't I had a call or a text message? I'm I like know. two blocks away. 
I'm sorry, you, I, Steve. I, I feel bad. You need to come down. All right. It, you know, I'm pulling the speedo it. out. It's, it's, it's snowing tonight. Come on down. We'll do it. I'm going to get on my sled. I'll tell you the cold plunge, and I'm not going to be like you see everyone on Instagram. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. telling you, it is a mental challenge every time I, I'm out there going, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I mean, yep. it's you think it would get easier. Dude, I'm telling you, I still struggle getting that thing. But once I get in there and I finally, you know, get in there and get in the get in the zone, dude, I tell you, anxiety's out the window. I get centered. I start feeling like, wow, life is good. It resets my central nervous system. Yeah. Um, I the list goes on. But I just want you, the listeners, to know that I did that because I want to evolve. I wanna, I wanna do things. I know you're big into, you know keeping yourself in shape, Steve. And I really admire you for that. And, and I do follow that. I'm really taking good care of my body. Mm-hmm. That's I'm evolving. I mean, I'm 54 years old and I still uh, challenge myself by doing Spartans and I work out and I, and I try to eat clean. And I, and I learned a lot of those lessons from you, Steve, honestly, like you taught me more about that stuff than anyone I've ever heard on Instagram anywhere, dude, like you, when it comes to that, you are the king in my in my eyes, and so, so that's how I'm evolving. I'm just trying to do different things and try to be a better light in this world and shine as bright as I can. Well, you are definitely a bright light, uh, and uh, appreciate you coming on and and sharing that light with our listeners today. So, on that note, folks, it is time for us to wrap up another episode of the Evolve, Evolve Podcast. I want to thank our guest Todd Sylvester for coming on uh, and sharing uh, some of his wisdom. And, folks, if you have not listened to Todd's podcast or you have not checked him out on social media, you really need to. Uh, you know, it, sometimes I, I've heard people say, well, Todd's podcast is a it's about recovery and it's about drug addiction and those sorts of things. And that's really just not the case. You share amazing stories of people from all walks of life. And while drug addiction and recovery are part of it, I like I said at the very beginning of this, I think everybody deals with the same challenges in life. Uh, and so I think that you're that's one of the powerful things about your your podcast is, is applicable to everyone, not just people who are dealing with drug addiction and recovery. So uh, I want to put a plug in there uh, for that. So Todd, what is the best way for people to follow your personal evolution and to, uh, to get more information from you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Toddinspires.com is my website, Toddinspires.com. You can also go to beliefcast.com. That's the name of my podcast. I call it a belief cast. And then on the app, you can go to, you'll get that all to my website, but you can also go to youroke.com and check that out as well. And so you can get all my social handles from there. My social handles, TS Inspires. And yeah, I mean, uh, that's probably the best way you can reach out to me if you have any questions or have anything you want to learn or know about me. And yeah, I'm, I'm an open book. I'll share anything with you. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Todd, for for joining us. And hey, folks, remember that it does take time and consistency to evolve. But first, you have to disrupt. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Evolve Podcast. Follow us on your favorite podcast app. And if you haven't done so, please give us a rating. As an independent podcast, it really helps us get more reach. This podcast is part of our mission to help millions of people evolve into the best versions of themselves. Please check out our coaching services at evolve-cast.com or pick up some of our Evolve merch. Until next time, keep evolving.